Okay, in this lesson we are looking at thermoregulation. Here are our dot points and we will get stuck in. All right, thermoregulation refers to the regulation of our body temperature. We understand that. And this is done managing uh, a metabolic rate or also through behavioral responses. So these are behavioral responses that are evolutionarily embedded in these organisms over many generations. They're not necessarily just a response to one environmental change, okay? Thermoregulation is a negative feedback mechanism. And you can see the oscillation on this graph. It's going up, it's going down, but also note that it's within a very small range. So even though it's going up and down, it's still relatively within that same um, limit. Okay, our body's in constant, uh, it's in a constant but gentle battle to manage our body temperature because the external environment changes so frequently. So an excellent example is um, how multiple receptor feedbacks, sorry, it is an ex excellent example of how multiple receptors feed back information to the control center to organize an entire whole body response. Now, year nine science taught you a lot about heat transfer, conduction, convection, radiation, and how those change, uh, that temperature changes particles and what they do. And we exchange heat through conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation. So same thing applies here, okay? We have radiation coming out, we can evaporate, we uh, cool ourselves down using convection and also conduction. Now, heat exchange is very different between different types of organisms, plants and animals, all that kind of thing. So endotherms and ectotherms. An endotherm generates its own heat through metabolic processes uh, to main an in, maintain an internal body temperature that's higher than the environment, like us, right? 37 degrees. The body temperature of ectotherms, however, depends on the environment. And you can see here that uh, this fish here is an ectotherm and it's going to change its body temperature based on the ambient or environmental temperature around it. Now, the hypothalamus here is our thermostat, and it detects any changes from a number of receptor sources, and it instigates a response before anything happens. So it's really preemptive, and it's thinking ahead. Arterial blood has the most constant temperature, right? We're talking blood in the arteries that's really internal to our body. Um, if other parts of the body maintain this temperature, then they're being well supplied with the blood, right? Thermoreceptors in the skin uh, detect changes in the external temperature, however, and the body can respond to ensure stability of that core body temperature. The responses can include increasing or decreasing blood flow to your skin. Okay, you know that when you go and exercise and you get really red, uh, and it can instigate behavioral changes, obviously. Can I find shade? Can I find shelter? All those kinds of things. So when a response just isn't strong enough to recalibrate our body temperature to the normal range, misalignment detectors can recognize the change to core body temperature and produce a more vigorous response and return the body to a set temperature. But even if you're lost in the Antarctic and your body's shivering harder, you know, potentially there is a point where you can't return. Now, the complexity of the responses once a change is detected is quite incredible. Um, and all of it can work at the same time to coordinate this whole body response. And that hypothalamus is really at the center of all of it. And it's continually collecting feedback and, you know, tweaking those changes accordingly. Right, multicellular organisms display different types of characteristics or adaptations with respect to this temperature control business, right? These characteristics can be structurally uh, adaptations, physiological adaptations or behavioral adaptations. Let's start with structural ones. All endotherms have structures that help them uh, to conserve or, or release heat, right? Number one is body coverings. Uh, we're talking about thick fur. We're talking about blubber that insulates against the cold. We have vascular body parts such as big ears to reduce... Um, sorry, big ears, um, to increase or the heat exchange happening. So if we need to cool down, we have that big surface area there and it allows the blood flow to go closer to the surface in more areas. We also have something called brown adipose tissue, which is a kind of fat tissue. Um, and we have an increased number of mitochondria in order to um, generate more heat through cellular respiration. Physiological changes are pretty interesting, actually, and one of them called countercurrent heat exchange. It involves the countercurrent flow of warmer and cooler blood in adjacent blood vessels, right? Ones running next to each other. For example, in the feet of penguins or like Arctic birds, um, cooled blood returning from the surface has to be warmed, right? As veins are closely aligned to the arteries carrying warm blood. So if we have a look what happens, this is without 
counter current exchange and the, the warm blood runs down and then by the time it reaches the really cold feet and it returns back to the heart it's really cold so a smarter way of doing it is actually it goes okay we're going to exchange the heat with the ones with the veins that are running back up the leg and we'll just let the feet go cold right so that the heat can uh, keep this stuff warm before it returns back to the heart there's also vasomotor control, which is really about dilation and constriction, so the, the spreading and, and tightening of the peripheral blood vessels in warmer conditions, right? If we uh, dilate them, it allows more heat to cross and therefore cool you down. Now, torpor is a really interesting thing, and it's kind of like a hibernation, and it's reduced activity to in um reduced activity like hibernation right and it increase or sorry significantly reduces your metabolic activity um, reducing your temperature and also your oxygen consumption now hibernation is a prolonged torpor in endotherms and estivation i can't say it properly is prolonged torpor in ectotherms right all right thermogenesis um, is happening in the cells of the brown adipose tissue we mentioned before and they display increased numbers of mitochondria so that we can be more efficient in energy creation and therefore add to more heat generation. We also know that we sweat and that is uh, cooling down via evaporative cooling mechanisms and we also shiver. Right, so some thermoregulatory mechanisms are described as being both behavioral and physiological um, and obviously structural and physiological interact quite a lot there. All right, behavioral ones, kleptothermy is just a fancy name for huddling together and essentially stealing the warmth off one another. Um, it's kind of cute, right? We also, well, not us, but dogs in particular, pant or you have a gaping mouth um, and that allows for that evaporative cooling again. Uh, organisms like to wallow or they like to spray water, so birds in bird baths. Um, this delightful one called urohydrosis is uh, essentially birds are pooing on their own legs and it encourages evaporative cooling. So in the same way that sweat covers your body and the heat um, evaporates off, same thing going on here, right? Pretty gross though. And the other one is seeking, uh, well, that's a, that should say shade and shelter. Now, human responses are obviously quite complex and it's that uh, constant oscillation that up and down to maintain our temperature that's really important. This is a picture from Pierce and it's really good. Our hypothalamus must detect higher or lower than normal temperatures and trigger that coordinated response though, right? And responses can be all of those types we just mentioned, behavioral, physiological. They can all be, also be hormonal uh, and nervous as well. Uh, we can't make too many structural changes as these have to be long-term, remember? So generation after generation. So yeah, we're altering our climate. We'll see what happens. All right, the human response to heat in particular, right? So we have voluntary ones like doing all those behavioral things, changing our body shape, so spreading out or, you know, huddling up if we're trying to retain our heat, um, removing clothing and um, decreasing activity, moving out of sun and shade. That makes sense. They're all voluntary. But if we're talking about involuntary ones that are happening without our control, we've got that vasodilation, so the, the widening of the blood vessels, uh, the evaporative cooling in our sweat and cellular respiration can actually slow down and therefore generate less heat. So this, this vasodilation and the vasomotor control is about that dilation and constriction of the blood vessels, remembering that it's changing how much evaporative cooling heat is happening. All right, responses to cold, uh, voluntary, once again, seeking shelter. If it's, you know, windy outside, we can change our body shape, we can pick up new clothes. Um, but our involuntary ones, once again, that vasoconstriction, right? So we're, they're constricting the blood vessels there to avoid heat loss. Um, but also the pillow erection, which is like um, the hair standing on end, which is an evolutionary mechanism, dates back to a very long time ago when we used to have fur. Uh, and also shivering, but also cellular activity can increase and this TRH hormone. So thyroid hormones regulate the rate of cellular metabolism and increasing the rate of metabolism, metabolism sorry, increases that heat production, that thermogenesis. Um, the hormone insulin is also involved in thermoregulation. It wears another hat as well. Um, and it acts on temperature sensitive neurons in the hypothalamus, which can then stimulate that brown adipose tissue we talked about to produce that heat. Lots going on here, okay, even though it is really only one tiny little dot point, um, still so many things that you need to consider. So make sure you're taking notes.